According to the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, there are more than 2 million survivors of rape living here in California. They made us wonder about making justice against the perpetrators of sex crimes a high priority for every woman, child, and member of our community. According to the Joyful Heart Foundation initi initiative and the backlog, the number of untested kids in the state of California is 13,615. Some politicians, like Assemblyman David Hsu, have recently called for an audit. Since we don't want to risk having people manipulate data or facts, we have asked our panel today to speak. To honor Women's History Month locally, we asked our panel to discuss what is happening here in Sonoma County. They will elaborate more on the process of testing rape kits, that we are, we are a test county for the Rapid DNA Service, which is, the acronym is RADS, system, and answer questions about backlog and violence prevent, prevention concerns. We also have a timekeeper, Justin Milligan, to keep us uh, on our pace so that we have five minutes allowed for each question. Um, we also have a question and comment card that if you would like to leave, uh, leave with tonight, uh, you can fill out and we will be glad to hand it to the panelists of your choice uh, for any questions that you may have or comments. And we'll get back to you with those responses. Our first panelist tonight is Christine Castillo. No wonder she won the Nonprofit Leadership Award last year. Give her a big applause for that. She has worked in the nonprofit world for the past 40 years. As Verity's leader, and she is committed to eliminating myths and stereotypes surrounding sexual assault and bringing our community together to become better informed, educated, and able to speak out against sexual abuse. Christine, please share with us a bit about the history of Verity, your current services of your organization offers, and please describe the local efforts for processing rape kits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelina and Maria, for uh, coordinating this and making this uh, opportunity happen for all of us. And thank you to Kai and to Melissa for your great uh, support uh, for this film and for all the many different um, social justice movements that have to be heard and, and that people have the opportunity to speak to and listen to about. Um, I have had the great honor to be executive director for Verity. I'm now in my 11th year, um, and it really it truly is an honor to have this, and a privilege to have this position um, and to work with all of the folks here um, on the panel. I myself am a, am a survivor of sexual assault, sexual violence, um, and gang rape by my brother and his friends from the ages of 10 to 13. I never spoke to anybody about this. I was one of the ones that kept silent until I was age 28. Um, so, me too, no more, all of it. Um, and we want to encourage anybody, anybody that knows anyone to speak out in the way that whatever it is that makes you feel comfortable to speak out or to reach out for help and support. Verity is Sonoma County's Rape Crisis, Trauma, and Healing Center. Each county and every state in the nation is mandated um, to have a rape crisis center, and we have been in existence. We are now in our 44th year. We began 44 years ago by a group of dedicated women and men who were really committed to supporting survivors of sexual violence and having them have a phone line where they could call and talk to someone. They could talk anonymously, but they had the opportunity to use their voice to speak about what had happened to them and to try to reach out and to get some help. From that um, crisis line, which is still kind of the main entree into our work, uh, today we have a counseling department that serves survivors of sexual violence in English and Spanish and Vietnamese um, and many other languages that we can 
uh, folks have needs, we will have translators in. We um, have a community education department that does a lot of work in the schools around educating youth, educating uh, faculty and staff, working with Sonoma State University and Santa Rosa Junior College um, around sexual violence, around rights, around responsibility, around uh, young men and what, they, what it means to be an honorable man and language and all sorts of things. And then we have our intervention department and our intervention department um, is the department that first works, uh, is first called when a sexual assault happens. Law enforcement calls us um, and if the survivor wants to make a report then they call Verity and we work, we are with the victim, with law enforcement, with the sexual assault nurse when those medical exams happen. We are there as a support to the survivor. If the survivor wants us in the medical exam room, we are there. If not, we sit outside and respect every boundary that, that they want and respect how they want to drive the, 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 the car. Because they have had something very profound taken from them. They have not said yes. They have been violated in so many ways and it is our responsibility, our duty to support them in using their voice and having their voice. We also have as part of that program, and Genevieve Hightower is here, she's one of our human trafficking sexual assault advocates. We work very closely and on behalf of those that are sold into sexual slavery and those that are trafficked both sexually and labor trafficked. And that is a growing concern in this county and in our community and we absolutely must be present to support survivors of human trafficking. Uh, we have a great group of people that work really hard and sometimes we have to have really difficult conversations that we don't enjoy at times, but we have those conversations. When Verity does something that just is a little off mark, we'll talk about it and we'll work it out and we will work it through. When law enforcement does something that's a little off mark, when the DA, we don't understand what's happening, we talk about it. We don't sit and let it fester, okay, I have 30 seconds left, but we really do try to work it out so that we can all say that we are doing our very best, everything that we can on behalf of survivors, because that is what we as a community must do. We must not let people continue to be silent. They have to be able to speak out in the best way that they feel, in their own way that is comfortable for them, and that's what we are doing. Thank you. Jade, hi. Um, you mentioned uh, on the phone when we spoke before the event, um, I got to meet you tonight, but we got the chance to talk on the phone a little bit. And you said that you were inspired after watching a movie called Shame um, that you saw that considered um, in your mind, what, what would you do if there were multiple attackers? And in this movie, we saw a very similar uh, consequence for our situation arise for, for Risi. So uh, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about what if, what if there are six attackers or seven attackers? And before you get to that question, can you tell us a little bit about the classes you teach? Sure. Thank you for having me on the panel tonight. My name is Jade De La Cruz, and I've been teaching women's self-defense to girls and women for 25 years. And uh, my classes include physical self-defense skills, techniques that are simple, easy to learn, easy to remember, and also very powerful and effective, and what we call incapacitating. Um, they're based on body weapons and vulnerable targets. My, I teach my students to use the hard parts of their bodies, we call them body weapons, against the vulnerable targets of an attacker's body. I also cover our legal right to use self-defense when we're in imminent danger. And I include information about dating and domestic violence, the psychological dynamics of a sexual assault, sexual harassment, um, stalking, um, a range of situations, dangerous situations that um, girls or women might face. And um, I, it's also really important to me to create an emotionally safe environment in my classes. Um, especially for any students who may be survivors and essentially every single class I've ever taught for 25 years I've had survivors in my classes. Um, so
Some of them survivors of childhood sexual abuse, some survivors of sexual assault, some survivors of dating or domestic violence, and some of all of the above. And um, the classes also include verbal self-defense skills, like yelling strong, powerful commands, and the power of uh, strong body language, strong eye contact, and uh, the power of adrenaline. Because of course, when we're in danger, we have a fight or flight response that includes adrenaline and a tremendous amount of energy that we normally don't experience when we're not in danger, and how to channel that adrenaline through these through the yelling and through the techniques. And I also teach assertiveness skills, um, because you don't have to wait until you're assaulted to use the skills that you learn in my classes. Um, in any relationship where you're gonna communicate with another human being, we have to set boundaries, we have to stand up for ourselves, we have to set limits, we have to, um, it's important just to live a healthy, authentic life that we are able to say no to things. And so um, we talk about no as a complete sentence and that we can say no without feeling guilty. We can say no without saying please. And um, my underlying or most important goal in my classes is to empower my students. No matter where they're at, I have students that are very shy and quiet and can barely yell but I'm just as encouraging and supportive of them as women who come in rare to go and louder than I am. So um, I love teaching self-defense. It's very meaningful work for me. It's very satisfying work to see girls and women um, becoming more confident and more empowered and more capable of handling a wide range of situations. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, my classes. I missed the last paper going up, so I'm I'm not exactly sure where I'm at. A minute and a half, okay. So, um, I teach beginning level classes and intermediate level classes. I've also trained instructors. And it's very common in my beginning level classes that students say, what if there's a weapon? What if there's more than one attacker? And my first answer is, you need to finish the beginning class before my answers are gonna make any sense. Um, and so at the end of my beginning classes, I try to always include some information on how you could verbally or physically defend yourself against an attacker with a weapon or multiple attackers. So it is possible to defend ourselves against an assailant with a weapon or multiple assailants. It certainly is psychologically scarier. And one of the things I emphasize is that our biggest disadvantage is psychological. If you believe you're helpless, then you probably will freeze, you'll panic, you'll blank out, you won't be able to see your options. But if you have a different belief system, I am strong, I am powerful, I am capable, I have options, I will find a way out of this, I can defend myself, then it's much more likely that you will be able to do that successfully. And so a huge transformation is psychological, mental, emotional, um, and I'm honored to be able to facilitate that in my classes. So, um, the emphasis is on body weapons and vulnerable targets, as I mentioned before, and an understanding that attackers, the psychology of the attacker in general is that they want it to be relatively easy, they don't want to get caught, and they don't want to get hurt and they're looking for someone they believe is an easy target. And when we do something that is strong and powerful and a shock or a surprise to an attacker, so shock being a psychological component, um, I have collected hundreds of stories over the years where essentially when we are loud, we are powerful, we are strong, we kick, we strike, and we cause pain in the attacker's body, that they are no longer interested in being anywhere near a woman who does those things. And they are typically going to run away, or if they're going to stop, double over in pain, and she's going to run away. So that can be true with a single attacker or with multiple attackers. And I know my time is up, so I'll stop there. That's great. Our next panelist to speak is Sonoma County Sheriff Rob Giordano. He began his career in law enforcement in 1989. In 1996, he was employed as deputy sheriff with Sonoma County Sheriff's Office. He worked for four years as domestic violence sexual assault detective before being promoted to sergeant in 2003. 
and after several promotions, he was appointed sheriff by the Board of Supervisors. Sonoma County Sheriff Giordano, although knowing that county statistics may not help someone who has been victimized, can you please share with us whether the testing of recent and cold case rape kits have resulted in arrests, if you can, how many, and what is your department policy on the implementation of the newest legislation signed into law, AB 41 DNA evidence, a reporting requirement for untested rape kits, and how do you foresee that the community can help law enforcement since many people may not be aware um, of what's going on with this law and there could be more transparency around that issue. Gee, that's a long question, but after a mind, I'm only so good. Yeah. Um, let me start with this. Statistics are a small piece of the puzzle, but it's uh, they have value, but they're only so good, right? So we won't even really talk about statistics. I mean, you have to use it to get a picture, but it's just a small piece of the puzzle. So let, let's talk a little bit about the second part of the statistics question, I believe, is how are uh, cold cases and how many cold cases we yes. solve with rape kits. You don't know what a rape kit is. Rape kit is the physical evidence we take from a victim or a suspect um, from their body and process it to try and prove biological evidence that this person was with this person, vice versa. Um, so we actually don't have any outstanding kits. We years and years and years ago got all the outstanding kits processed. Um, laws have changed. It's, laws have changed over the years because of education and events like this, um, and it's helped us get funding and money and the government to speed that process up. So years ago, we got rid of all the old cases and got the backlog back, and actually since 2011, every one of our cases gets processed usually within 20 days. So, and, and again, this is, this is not just us. I mean, we are, we are one of the, we are an agency that was part of a pilot program in the state to do this, but it was really about legislature and state funding and money through the Department of Justice to get this done. So what happens today is when a rape kit's done, swabs are taken, within five days they're sent to the lab, and their goal is to return that stuff back to the law enforcement agency in 20 days to see if there's a hit or not. Um, that's the beauty of the system today. So all of our kits are up to date for the last seven years. We have the returns. Now to address the question of how many arrests result in cold cases, it's very few, and let me explain that. 93% of the sexual assaults are uh, the victim knows the offender. Those cases where they don't know the offender are those typical cold cases that you get a hit, a DNA hit, and that DNA hit helps us identify a suspect and make an arrest. And it happens, but there's very few of those in the system because 93% are known. Now we get hits on those 93%, so when, when uh, this victim accuses this suspect, we can match those two together in those hits. And it helps build the case, but there's a lot of other facts in the case that go with it. So absolutely important piece of the puzzle, but it doesn't in and of itself make an arrest in most cases. It does in those very narrow circumstances, which you tend to read about in the paper. They're pretty good cases when you can't identify someone and you find out who they are. Um, I personally have had those cases, and, it, and I'll tell you, in, in two, roughly 2000, it took a year and a half to get DNA back. So I literally was in investigations when this stranger attack happened. I was back out on the street, did a different assignment when the paper came back a year and a half later and identified the guy that did it, and it was that stranger case. <laughs> Today, that turnaround is much faster, and that's really made the difference for us. Again, legislation, movements like this, pushing the government to get the money and the, and the testing science, got the testing easier for us. So we're in a much better place today as far as technology goes. Now, I'm missing something. Oh, uh, AB 41. Oh, so. I'm sorry, I forget which number is which law, but let me just catch up to that. We've been in compliance with the current laws since the day they were enacted. And in essence, the current stuff, what's changed is it's really about victims' rights. It's about someone who's had a sexual assault kit, their ability to call the law enforcement agency, find out the status of it, is there a hit, the status at any time. Those laws also have set up a database that we, the Department of Justice, enter the information into so at any time we can track where that kid is. So theoretically, if I send a kid to the Department of Justice, 
they don't lose it because it comes, it, we enter it in the system and they see it in the system. So it helps us keep that tracking. It helps us be able to immediately respond to a victim with, here's where your kid is, here's what the hit was, or it's in the system getting searched right now. So that, that is the bulk of it. It's, and the bulk of it is rights for victims. A very important piece of the puzzle, right? That, that is um, so crucial. If there's anything I leave you with today, it's encourage people to talk, encourage people to report, and encourage people to say what they want. One of the things I learned in the job was, we don't control what happened to you, you control what happened to you. So if I ask you a question, you don't understand why I'm asking, then you tell me why you're asking me that question. I want to know why before I answer it. And that's a really important piece of the puzzle is we're here to work for you, the victim. So encourage people who've been through this to take that positive stand because they've already been through enough. And each one of us up here has a role. We can help you with that, but I don't want people to not come to us because they're afraid of what happens. Such an important piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Uh, DA Jill Ravage, um, uh, you're the first woman to serve as DA in Sonoma County. Um, she took office. In, uh, she took office in 2011 and is now serving her second term. Uh, she began her prosecutorial career at the Alameda County DA's office and moved to Sonoma County in 1990 and joined the Sonoma County DA's office. Um, so I, I have several questions. Um, one is, can you describe how you are leading in the effort to clear rape kit backlogs in Sonoma County? Although we just heard from the sheriff a little bit about that, but you can describe maybe the process of uh, how we're leading in the effort. Um, is there a backlog? No. What is the conviction rate? Uh, the sheriff kind of went over some of that. Um, but can it, since the sheriff discussed that, can you inform the community about the RADS process? Sure, thank you. Um, and fortunately, the sheriff answered most of my questions. Yes. So, thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, kind of catch up. You can talk about rats. Yeah. He just kind of took all your questions. You know, and, and I think that's a really important point that started with Chris. We work together. When I started in this business over 30 years ago, we didn't play well together. Um, Chris and other advocates were there for the victim. Rob and me and other people in law enforcement were there to get the bad guy. And we didn't quite understand how we were both working for the same outcome. And we've gotten really better at that. And uh, just a quick shout out for the Family Justice Center. If you haven't heard of it, grab a flyer outside because all of our agencies are there working together to serve victims of sexual violence as well as family violence, and we've served over 7,000 clients since we opened in 2011. So here's the deal. If you have unfortunately been a victim of sexual assault and you think there has been some type of bodily fluid transfer or some other uh, material, organic material that may have been transferred, then you will be asked if you will participate in a sexual assault exam by a forensic nurse. And that's the process Chris talked about. And we have a special place at Sutter for it to occur. If you're a child, we do it at the FJC. There's a, a kit that is put together by the state Department of Justice, and the nurses are trained in how to collect the evidence. And they do it with uh, the assistance of an advocate if the client chooses to have the ad advocate present. There are standardized questions that are asked, and the whole process is documented. The kit then goes to DOJ, and because we are part of the RADS pro program since 2011, uh, three uh, samples go to DOJ within, I think Rob's, Rob said, five days, and then we get a result within 20 days, which is terrific. Um, now, there are times, and Chris didn't touch on this, when uh, victims don't want those kits to go anywhere. And don't forget, there are lots of times when there is no kit taken. Uh, and as Rob said, 93% they know the perpetrator, so that kid isn't going to be of that great of assistance. And I've done some cold hits. Keep in mind, you may have the kit from the victim, but you still have to match it to a perpetrator. And if the perpetrator's not in the system, it could be a while before that hit works. We take buccal swaps from people that are booked on felonies. 
Well, now that we have reduced so many felonies to misdemeanors, many people are not subject to those buccal swabs, so they're not going into our DNA system. So we are reducing the number of potential uh, subjects who we can match with some of these kits, unfortunately. Um, but the process is a good one. I have presented this evidence in court going way back, longer than I care to admit, when we had to actually have long hearings about the admissibility of the evidence. It's powerful, powerful evidence. And fortunately, jurors understand it better now and accept it better. Uh, we recently, it's not a sexual assault case, but I just want to give an example. We had a, an unsolved murder on 4th Street in Santa Rosa. They had done fingernail scrapings at the autopsy of the woman who was left dead, stabbed. Those fingernail scrapings ultimately were matched to buccal swabs from a man who was arrested on a drug charge. Years later, we were able to connect him to the crime, and I'm very proud to say he was convicted of first-degree murder. And that's an excellent example of how effective DNA evidence can be in the courtroom. Uh, I've done DNA cases as well where there's stranger rapes, and it's very, very powerful evidence. With regard to conviction rates, you can move the data any way you want. But I think the best takeaway for you is we are working together, we are supporting victims of violence uh, as best as we can, and it's incumbent upon all of us, if you know somebody who's a victim of sexual assault, you tell them it's okay to tell your story in whatever setting you choose, at the Family Justice Center, at Verity, if you want to go to law enforcement, but tell your story. As of 2017, the statute of limitations for rape is now life. So you're not going to be restricted by the number of years since the crime occurred. And hopefully that will encourage people to come forward and tell their stories as well. So I hope I answered your questions, Rob, and most of the heavy lifting. <laughs> Our next panelist, Elaine B. Holtz, is a host of Women's Spaces on KDBF. Elaine first produced the show in 1978 in uh, KDBF in Santa Rosa, which is the nation's first bilingual radio station in the country. She is also the president of the Sonoma County Chapter of the National Organization for Women now since 2017. It may come as a shock to many here today as it did to us when we discovered that California law currently does not require that rape kits be inventory or tested. One of the issues that the National Association for Women now is working is ending violence against women. Elaine, could you give us some background on now and a brief overview of the most recent California state legislation, the bills that have been passed, and the bills that are pending, which address rape kits? And what action can we take today to increase public safety, to hold, our, hold offenders accountable, and to offer a path to justice and healing for the survivors of sexual assault? Well, first of all, do I turn it on? No, yeah, I'll put it on. First of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. The first statement I want to make, though, is after watching the movie, what really became very clear to me is that we have to stand together as women. Not women of color, not white women, not black women, not, not Chinese women or whatever, but women. That we are all suffering from this horrendous thing. I mean, it's coming out, it's, it's shocking to me. And all I could do when, as I watched the film is just cry. I mean, I was crying. I was thinking of what it must feel like to be a black woman, what it must feel like to be raped, what it must feel like to not have any power to say anything. So I, I really think it's important that we look at that. Uh, now is the oldest organization in the United States for women. We have 500,000 members. So whenever I stand up and speak in our county, there are 500,000 women who have dedicated themselves to become members. And we have five issues that we're working on. And I made sure, I want to make sure that I'm giving you the correct information. So I'm going to read what we're doing with, with violence. 
One of the issues now is involved in is ending the criminalization of violence. Women and girls affected by sexual violence at an alarmingly high rate in the United States. This violence is ignored on a cultural and institutional level. Men in power are not held accountable for their actions while millions of women are forced to suffer in silence. Moreover, women are the victims of violence and are often criminalized and incarcerated for behaviors stemming from that abuse. Now is committed to ending violence of all forms against women through legislative advocacy on a state and federal level, uplifting protections and women across all sectors, and providing resources for women to address the psychological and emotional trauma stemming from violence and to aim to eradicate the cultural aspect of it. And what's so interesting is when uh, Evelina first brought this to me and we start looking, oh, already it's 30 seconds. No, when we minutes. start looking, no, pardon? No, three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, three, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, when Evelina first brought this to me, I was really shocked because I found out there were actually three legislations that were passed. But the interesting thing about them was there was no mandate. There was no, the, the county, I mean, we should really give our county a great yes. big yes. round of applause. Yes. And we, uh, we, have, we have a woman district attorney that's on top of it, and also the Family Law Center. It's an amazing, amazing process. You should go down. I did an interview on them. I was so impressed that we even had something like that in our county. So it's very important that you become involved, because there's three other, let me just read this to you really quickly. There's some other legislation that's uh, on the table right now. It's, oh God, I hate paper. <laughs> Evelina, you gave it to me. I can't find it. Oh, here we go. On March 22nd, Senator uh, Connie Laria introduced SB 1449, which strengthens existing law by requiring the swift submission and testing of newly controlled rape kits. Then there's another one, SB 1449, would also mandate law enforcement to submit reports. In other words, they have to do it. It's not like oh, you know, maybe I'll do it, or I'm going to see if it's okay if I don't do it. They're going to have legislation that is actually going to force that they're going to have to make reports. And then the other aspect of it is how do we get involved? You know, as women, we have to pay attention to some of the legislation that's going on and make calls. Call your legislators. Call your board of supervisors. Call your city council members. Call your state senators. Call your call the federal senators. All your elected officials and tell them that they've got to make sure that the laws in place are laws that stick. That they have to respond to them and act to them, and that's the way we will protect women. And I want to just end with one last thing. Jill mentioned the Family Law Center. I did a wonderful interview with her on Women's Spaces. You go to www.womenspaces.com, just type, it, type in Jill Ravage, it'll come up. She talks all about the Family Law Center, and it's so important that as women, as people, as men, everybody knows that we have this resource in our county. Thank you so much for letting me talk and for being here. And thank you, Evelina and Maria. Let's give them a big hand. And to Tracy Taylor, may she rest in peace because she brought something forward yes. that all of us need to be aware of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Welcome. Thank you. So reassuring that no one's sitting on her case here. We have an amazing county and we heard it with our own ears and um, I feel great about that. Thank you. And I hope everyone else here does. Uh, that was a very uh, emotional film and I know it wasn't part of our script to, to talk to you, but I just feel that I want to uh, acknowledge that all of you sat through that and felt something and, and uh, it's, a, it's really important to talk to your friends and family members about this and to continue to uh, uh, not only speak about issues that are difficult to talk about and have those hard conversations, but also to acknowledge your own feelings around that. And um, thank you very much for being here. Um, I get even the three minute or whatever from <laughs> the timekeeper. I talk a lot though. So, um, but we're very glad that we got to be, get informed here today. Thank you very much. Please give them a round.
Uh, and in conclusion, we'd also like to thank our uh, sponsors. Um, I just want to thank everybody, and again, from the bottom, just thank you for being here today. To be truthful, I first learned about this film from another person who I think deserves applause, is Amy Goodman, who actually interviewed both the author of the book and the director of the movie. And my first thought was, I really want to see this film, but I don't think people would want to see it because it's not like a Transformer movie or something. I knew it was going to be deep. And now that I saw it, it was actually deeper than I imagined. And I'm even more glad that, um, that we were able to make this happen. And this happened thanks to our sponsors. Um, we'd like to thank Melissa Hathaway, the Director of Marketing and Community Relations, for all the help to make this happen. The Rialto Cinema for donating um, to Verity. Proceeds from the ticket sales. <laughs> Definitely wanted to shout out to Vesta Copesakes who allowed us to print our story in the Gazette, um, where we gave background on how Sad on Our Case started, and we were able to promote this event. And now that I saw how important the press was, I did, the first thing that came to my mind was Vesta and the Gazette. Um, that was really powerful for me. Women's Spaces, Elaine, thank you for sharing this story on your radio show and for also interviewing one of our panelists, um, Jade. We also want to thank Fiumara and Milligan Law. Thank you so much for being here and being an awesome timekeeper. Um, Heather and John Mutz. Mutz is a cut running for sheriff, and thank you very much for being a sponsor today. And our local librarian, Courtney Klein, who actually um, let us borrow the book from the library that the movie was based on so we can get a better understanding of what we were dealing with. So, library go, yay. yay. <laughs> and I do want to say something for her to remind everybody if you're interested. Uh, the library right here in Sebastopol is going to be showing the film The Women's March. Um, on Monday, April 2nd at 7. So if you haven't had a chance to see the documentary about the Women's March, head over to the library. You can go ahead and see it. Vesta? Um, I learned something. And one of the things I thought about was rape kits. We always think about semen samples. Um, but I was thinking as you were talking about rape kits, about um, sinking your fingernails into someone to get pieces of their flesh. And then Jill said, that a uh, murder case was solved by the, the flush underneath the nails. And I thought, it's probably one of the more powerful ways to gather evidence. If someone ever actually rapes somebody, you've got their finger, their body underneath your fingernails, and it becomes evidence. And I think it's a powerful one. It causes pain, and then it also collects DNA. What a yeah. wonderful thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, just to finish up here again, let's please give a big applause to our panelists, our sponsors, the Rialto, everybody. To you for sitting through a very difficult film, a very difficult documentary. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.